So can I can I welcome everyone um, to today's meeting of the British Palestine All Party Parliamentary Group? Um, can I remind everyone if they're not speaking at the moment to keep muted, just so that we don't have a lot of feedback? Thanks ever so much. Um, <clears throat> Today, um, we're going to the issue that we're talking about is military invasions of Palestinian homes in the West Bank. Um, and we're going to be hearing from a number of organizations, Breaking the Silence, Physicians for Human Rights in Israel, and Yeshdin. So we've got a broad range of uh, contributions to hear today. Um, we're going to be hearing, hearing from four speakers from the three organisations and then at the end of that there'll be an opportunity to ask questions as always. So if you can indicate in the chat if you'd like to ask a question as we go through and then we'll come to the questions at the end of all the contributions. Um, so we'll start with Ziv Stahl who is the Director of the Research de Department at Yeshdin and a board member at Zazim Community Action and at Akavot Institute for Israeli-Palestinian Conflict Research. So over to you, Ziv. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Julie. Um, so I'll be opening. Uh, and first of all, I want to say thank you all for coming for this briefing. We appreciate it very much. Uh, I will be followed by Avner Gouvriao from Breaking the Silence and Dan Dana Moss from uh, uh, Physicians for Human Rights and Murad Jodala, which is also a co-worker with me in Yashlin. Uh, the four of us comes from organizations that have been working on occupation for many, many years. In fact, if you put together all of our experience of working uh, years together, we have 60 years of working on the occupation. So we all know very well all the harmful practices of the occupations, the checkpoints, the taking over lands, uh, the settlement, the settler violence, and uh, many, many more. Uh, but despite all this knowledge, uh, when we came to work on uh, the home invasions, uh, we realized it's uh, still an, a, a subject that is, uh, was not talked about. And this is despite the fact that uh, home invasions, are, uh, they have deep uh, effect over the Palestinians on every family, on daily life, on the health and mental health of uh, children and grown-ups. Uh, and on the entire Palestinian population and society. Uh, this is one of the central uh, practices that Israel uses in the West Bank. And I think it's really important that you would keep in mind throughout this presentation that uh, almost any, every Palestinian family has experienced a home invasion of soldiers to their home. So we want to share with you today some of what we have learned about home invasions during a three years uh, joint project on this topic. Uh, and since it was the first time that anyone has ever done such a deep, I think, and focused and wide uh, work on this issue, we started with uh, the collection of testimonies. We wanted testimonies that will help us understand how home, inv home invasions looks like, uh, how they affect whoever experiences them. Uh, and for that, uh, we, we at Yashdin has collected 158 testimonies from Palestinians that uh, soldiers, Israeli soldiers, has invaded their homes. Uh, Physicians for Human Rights has returned to 31 of these families and held an in-depth uh, interview with the same families in, in order to learn uh, what the effects and the ramifications of the invasions on the mental health of the families. And Breaking the Silence has conducted 80 interviews with the soldiers who participated in home invasions. And from these testimonies, we try to learn about the procedures, the instructions that are given to soldiers, and basically how these invasions are actually done in practice. Uh, and I think one of the most important things to understand that is that home invasions to Palestinians' homes are routine reality in the West Bank. Every night, uh, armed soldiers enter Palestinians' homes. They wake up the children, they wake up the parents from their night's sleep. In average, we are talking about at least 267 invasions per month. This is according to uh, OCHA data, the UN data, and they only document uh, invasions that are done in order to uh, perform a search or arrest. We know that there are other reasons, which I'll tell you about in a minute, so we know there, there are more than uh, this average. We basically identified 
four types of uh, home invasions uh, that are done uh, by the army. The first one is search. Uh, the soldiers enter the house in order to search for money, weapon, documents, uh, some other objects. The second one is arrest of one of uh, the people who are in the house or few of the people that are in the house. Uh, the third one is mapping and documenting the physical structure uh, of the house and uh, of the people who are, live in, who are living in the house. And the last one is a seizure for operational needs. That means that the army invades the house usually for a longer period of time in order to set up an observation post or a shooting post and sometimes uh, to use the house as a hiding place. Uh, and these are the four types. Uh, these invasions happen all over the West Bank. You can see over in the map that uh, is now on presentation. It happens in every district. Uh, most of the families we have talked to, 64% uh, of them, has told us that the army invaded their home more than one time. Uh, and they also said, and this is something that the army do not deny, uh, actually admits to, that most invasions happens at night, uh, very late at night or very early in the morning, uh, usually between midnight and 5 a.m. And I want to linger uh, a little bit on this data because it's really important. Most families has, in, has experienced more than one invasion of armed soldiers in the middle of the night in their home. And I ask you maybe to try to imagine yourself living that way, living with the knowledge that when you go to sleep at night, every night, an armed force may open the door, may not break the door actually, uh, without advance notice and enter your house. How would that affect your life? Uh, how would that affect your families? Is it reasonable to live like this? Is, it a is this practice is even reasonable? Uh, so we've seen some data and I want to talk a little bit about the legal uh, framework that allows the army uh, to invade uh, private homes so frequently. I think uh, the most important thing to understand is that these uh, invasions are uh, done many times arbitrarily. And unlike what the army argues, it is not always necessary to prevent terror or for uh, uh, security reasons. Uh, one of the things that is most notable, notable is that there is no warrants. There is no search warrant, there is no other kind of warrant. And that means that there is no judicial review uh, on these invasions. There is no judge that is presented with uh, the reasons for the invasion, with facts, and then he can uh, weigh the, the facts and decide whether or not to approve uh, the home invasion. Moreover, every officer can decide to invade a house, even a junior officer in the army. And that means sometimes a very young uh, man, sometimes 19. Uh, the grounds that allows invasions are very, very wide. Almost anything can be a reason for a home invasion. There is no need in a certain suspicion that someone has committed an offense or is involved in any kind of criminal or uh, security activity. Uh, basically, some of the invasions, like mapping, that uh, I will, I'm sure we'll get into a little bit later, uh, these, these invasions are done without any suspicion at all. And all of this opens the door for invasions that are not really justified and not really necessary, uh, uh, in our opinion. Now, I think for everyone uh, who lives in a democratic uh, country, it's kind of hard to understand or even imagine that the army can decide arbitrarily to enter a house uh, at all times without anything uh, that prevents them from doing so. Usually when we think about our home, we think about a safe place, a place where uh, state agencies or uh, law enforcement agencies uh, cannot enter. And if, in, if they enter, it, it is considered a very unusual step. Uh, one of the reasons for that is that entering a private home is uh, perceived as a violation, a serious violation of our privacy. Uh, this is, of course, not the case in the West Bank. Another reason why the policy, the Israeli policy of home invasion in the West Bank is so problematic is that there is no responsible body that uh, is in charge of examining whether a specific action is not only necessary, but also proportionate. 
a judge would have been uh, not only examining whether uh, a, a certain a specific entry is justified in uh, terms of suspicion, but also the ramifications, the implications of such entry. In order for any action by the state to be legal, uh, both by international law, but also according to the Israeli law, the action needs to be proportionate. That means that the benefit that this action uh, is supposed to achieve is greater and bigger than the damage it might inflict. And the state has to balance between the benefit and the harm. The problem with uh, such widespread uh, practice like home invasions and a practice with no review and no supervision is that no one examines uh, the use of the practice versus the, the harm it causes. No one weighs the violation of privacy, uh, the violation of dignity, the trauma, the effect on the mental health that Dana will elaborate uh, soon enough on. Uh, that means that in many cases that we've seen, not only that the action is arbitrary, but it is actually disproportionate and therefore illegal. And just to sum uh, things up, because I think I'm already uh, being a bit long, uh, when a young officer, any officer can decide on home invade uh, to invade to uh, the home of a Palestinian family, he does not weigh any of the, uh, uh, the things that I just mentioned. He doesn't think whether it's necessary, whether it's justified, whether it's proportionate. He doesn't think of the causes and the ramifications of the invasion. Our research found that in many uh, of the cases, the home invasions are done without any connection to a specific danger or threat to Israel or Israelis. And that the harm that uh, Palestinians are experiencing because of these invasions is very significant and, it, and uh, Israel doesn't take it under consideration. And the other thing I want to say just uh, to close is that uh, we all see home invasions as a practice that uh, basically uh, is used by the Israeli army in order to preserve uh, Israeli control over the Palestinians uh, and to preserve the occupation and basically to oppress uh, Palestinians, to create a sense of fear of a lack of control, a sense of uh, the army is everywhere and can enter uh, uh, any place, any time, even your own home. And I think I will leave you with that and uh, let Avner take over. Sorry. Thank you, Ziv. Hi. Should, should, I, should I go or? Yes, yes, Murad, please. Is Murad next? Is Murad there? Uh, Avner is next. Okay, I'm everybody, you're in a different order than I were given, but you're very welcome, Avania, to speak next. Let me just introduce you. Um, Avania is from the Israeli city of Rehovat. Uh, during his army service, he served in special forces of the Paratroopers Brigade, where you attained the rank of Staff Sergeant. And a year after completing your service, you joined Breaking the Silence as a researcher and tour guide with a full focus on the diaspora jury and later served as head of, out of the public outreach department. And I know when I visited um, the occupied territories in 2017, uh, the visit that the tour that Breaking the Silence uh, gave myself and other parliamentarians was incredibly useful and uh, was a real eye opener to what was really happening. So over to you, thanks. Thank you so much, uh, and it's a real honor to be um, to be part of, of this conversation today. Um, uh, I've been really with Breaking the Silence for, for a while, for, for a decade, really since I finished my service, more or less, and been executive director for the past uh, three plus years. Um, but I really think that um, this, this report and this collaboration has been one of the most uh, important and unique things that I had the chance to take part in. Um, so before I, I sort of dive into that a bit, um, I do wanna sort of start with something that um, um, sort of on a personal note, something that, that, I, that I wrote that I'd like to share um, this evening. Um, um, and it's part of, uh, of a piece that, that I published, I'd be happy to share as well. It was sort of part of our report. Um, at night, uh, while the household sleeps, uh, my team gets ready outside. One person knocks on the door and almost immediately after another breaks in. We enter quickly with force, weapon drawn. 
weapons drawn. Some of us have paints on our face, others are not concealed. Someone gathers the family and knocks and locks them in a room. There's shouting and broken Arabic and rapid Hebrew and vice versa. Quickly, quickly, your papers. Items are moved, sometimes breaks. One of us photographs the room, ske um, sketches it in a notebook. Hours pass, sometimes days. Then we leave on our way to the next house. Cut. That's as far as my memory goes. Like a spectator at a movie, hastening to sink into the next scene. I never imagined what was going on in the house as soon as we leave. If you like symbolism, you can find it easily enough in the military law book. The clause permitting invasion of homes, clause number 67 of the order regarding security provision states, an officer or soldier, so authorized in general or in specific instances, is authorized to enter at any time, any place. Um, so, so I served as a sergeant of a, of a sniper's team um, um, in the paratrooper brigade um, and entered myself um, dozens of homes as a soldier and later on as a sergeant. Uh, I led these missions as well. Um, this um, was definitely one of the major reasons that uh, motivated me to to break my silence and, and to speak out um, the things that um, I myself did um, in those homes, the power that, that I had over um, those Palestinians in the middle of the night um, was really what uh, I would say started my, um, my process and, and, and was where, um, um, where the biggest questions were, were, were posed. Um, as, as, a, as a soldier and, and as a sergeant, um, it was very clear from, from, from early on that uh, the houses that, uh, that we enter um, are, are homes of uh, Palestinians uh, that were innocent, um, or as we call them in the military jargon, we don't talk about innocent Palestinians, but Palestinians who are involved or not involved, involved in what, in resistance, terrorism and so on and so forth. So um, one of the first homes that we entered as a, as a, as a young soldier uh, was a house of an innocent Palestinian family um, where it was where their house was used as Ziv mentioned, one of the reasons homes are invaded, um, we enter that house as, a, as an observation point. What is called um, military jargon, um, a straw widow. Um, so you take over a private house and use that house as your own. And that was a big part of, of my military service. Um, first as a, as a soldier, later on as a sergeant, um, you, you get a mission to uh, have either troops uh, in, the, in specific parts of the city and you have to have soldiers sort of eye in the sky to protect them. Uh, more in other instances, just uh, the mission itself is taking over the house. Um, so before you enter the house, you uh, uh, make sure that you're in the right geographical area. Um, every Palestinian house across uh, the occupied territories um, is numbered. So you have aerial photos of the entire area and every house is marked with a number. You check with a secret service to make sure that people inside the house will not risk you or risk your troops. And after you make sure they're innocent, you're good to go. Uh, usually, and this obviously is echoed in in the in the in our report and in the um, very important testimonies of uh, Yeshdin and Physicians for Human Rights. We would enter the house at night, um, and and those were our our hours of of operation. Um, and the moment you uh, either break in the door or the doors open if they move, if the family moves quickly enough, the entire family is under your control. Uh, many times handcuff uh, and blindfold the head of the family and throw the entire family in the room and the, and the house is yours for your mission. So um, if you need to use the, 
the, the dining room table to put the observation equipment or the sniper rifle, if you need the carpet or a blanket to cover the window, right? Everything is in this perspective of this tactical perspective of the mission, while the scenery are people's houses and homes um, um, and, and, and very, um, you know, the, the most private and sacred um, spaces uh, for them. Um, so, so I, I think that those those are really the moments that that, that motivated me. I think to, to break my silence. But uh, throughout my service and 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 a big part of of the testimonies that we've received from other um, combat soldiers, uh, officers, um, company commanders, uh, you know, as as up as, as up as company commanders, I mean these these missions. Are, and I think this is one of the most important things that comes up from our testimonies, and I think is, is really echoed with Palestinian testimonies. You know, this is an integral part of our military occupation. This is an integral part of this military control area. I would call it the military dictatorship that we're maintaining um, over Palestinians uh, for such a long time. And in the same way that um, We've seen, and and this was definitely part of the you know the, the visual scene um, around the world. Thinking of you know the visions of a checkpoint, um, or maybe the separation barrier, or um, you know maybe a, um, a, a, a disbursement of a violent demonstration. Uh, I mean, uh, the the invasion of homes is is part of the DNA um, of the Israeli military control. Um, and and um, not only do we invade homes for uh, straw widows, but we will invade homes um, to use them uh, for soldiers to rest. We'll invade homes, um, obviously, for arrests. Um, we'll invade homes for searching and for mapping. And this is all detailed in the report. Um, but I think in the end of the day, there isn't really um, a way, and I think this is you know, very evident, there isn't a way to run away from it. Um, and, and I think that, that that's part of the idea. Um, um, there are always sort of micro tactic uh, reasons that soldiers or officers will explain to themselves of the home invasions, but those are sort of tactical reasoning. I think the strategic reasoning um, is, is as, as you've said, this idea of, of making our presence felt of showing our control. And, and, and one way to do that besides, um, you know, uh, checkpoints and patrols um, and, and so on and so forth is this, is this tool of home invasion. Um, and I'll just, I'll just end by, by saying that um, um, I think that uh, for, for us as, as a group of former soldiers, um, you know, it's, um, it, it, was, it was really sort of part of our, our process of, of speaking up was, was, was what we did, was, was our actions. And, you know, as, as, I, as I, what I started with, I think that for, for me, it, the, you know, my actions in these homes uh, ended. Uh, you know, the, the, that scene that had ended the, the moment I left and, and um, the, the things that I did in the homes, the, 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 the anger, the hatred that, that, uh, that that uh, that I caused um, was was really I think something that stuck with me. But but even though I've been I've been at this for a while and and read many testimonies and and, and met many Palestinians and visited many Palestinian homes uh, as as an activist and as a civilian, um, my my uh, perspective really ended in a deep way with my experience leaving that house. And, and I think what, what this report does in such an important way is, is picture this holistic picture of what you know, soldiers are being asked to do and what they leave in these homes, which is, which is uh, fear, which is um, 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 violence. Um, and, and I think um, you know, most evident uh, is trauma. Um, and, and, and I think that um, in, in order for us to uh, be able to um, um, end the, this reality, uh, we first and foremost have to understand uh, what it's all about. And I think that uh, this report is a, is a very, very important place to start. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Anga. That was quite harrowing listening to that, but 
um, very important that someone like you will share that experience with us. Um, we'll go next to Dana. I think I've got the right order now. Dana Moss is the International Advocacy Coordinator at Physicians for Human Rights Israel. Dana, over to you. You're muted, Dana. We can't hear you. Hi. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, I want to speak a little bit about what happens after um, the soldiers come in. Um, and from, I want to elaborate on that from the perspective, uh, from the mental health perspective of the impact on Palestinian women, men, and children. Uh, and I want to uh, read uh, one of uh, the most difficult stories uh, that we heard. Um, that of a seven-year-old uh, that we named F for the files uh, in her mother's words. When the soldiers beat me in front of F's eyes and I had a nervous breakdown, my husband took me to the hospital and F stayed with her siblings at home. They had told me they had gone looking for her and found her on the second floor at the kitchen window, trying to throw herself down. When I spoke to her, she told me she thought I had died and wanted to die to join me. I told her I was fine and that I was near her. This is one example of the mental health impact of forcible home invasions. And I wanna speak about them as potentially traumatic events and to highlight the post-traumatic stress symptoms that cause such significant harms to the mental well-being of Palestinian adults and minors that we as a, as a right to health organization saw on the ground. And here I want to emphasize the idea of the home um, as the most intimate and safe space where we as individuals have control. Um, this is all the more so at night where we each have our own routines. Maybe your time to put your children to bed. Um, if you have children, it might be your time to read a book or to watch some television before going to sleep. And we really focused on the question of what happens when the quiet of the night is suddenly shattered by armed soldiers, often occupying power, um, entering the house. Physicians for Human Rights Israel, which focuses on the right to health of all those under the responsibility of the Israeli government, uh, works together with roughly 3,000 healthcare volunteers. And our role in this project was to bring in our mental health expertise to the discussion of what these events mean. How do we do this? Um, we uh, set up a mental health committee of mental health experts who designed the interviews and carried out the analysis. Uh, as they've mentioned, we interviewed uh, 20 women and 11 men um, who were parents to 41 children. We did not interview children directly to minimize re-traumatization. Um, and I want to say that even for these very experienced mental health professionals, reading the interviews was very difficult. Uh, our findings were that these sudden forced intrusions into the victim's most private space accompanied by threats and sometimes actual physical violence were potentially traumatic events. And emotional trauma is what happens when we come face to face with a stronger power from whom we cannot protect ourselves. Traumatic events cause deep physical, emotional and cognitive changes. Uh, they dissolve the sufferer's sense of security and trust in their surroundings. Uh, akin to sexual assault, to robbery, uh, to car accidents. Um, and it's all the more so with uh, forced home invasion because often these are repeat events uh, in your specific home, in your neighbor's home, in your village. And then there's repeat contact with traumatizing agents, namely the soldiers. Uh, loss of control is one of the, the main aspects that we saw that are really uh, is at the core of any traumatic event. Uh, and the central post-invasion experience reported by most interviewees was that of a loss of control, uh, combined with fear for their lives, fear for their children's lives. Uh, this really translated into how they viewed soldiers, which is machines or, or people spoke about them being inhuman, which points to the sense of utter helplessness and powerlessness um, that they have over the situation, which exacerbates any anxiety involves, uh, increasing the likelihood of post-traumatic stress. Uh, and this loss of control remained long after the invasion took place. Uh, it impacted parents who experienced helplessness in their parental role 
It impacted children seeing their parents unable to help them. Um, and I want to read uh, the next testimony, which really sheds light on what loss of control actually means. They broke into my house 10 times, and each time they arrested one of my sons. I have no sense of security inside the house. My husband and I sleep on the veranda rather than the bedroom, so we can hear any movement or the sound of dogs. I know that the army is here. I keep worrying they will raid the house again. I keep my clothes next to me all night and I cannot fall asleep after 1 a.m. I want to quickly do a sort of deep dive into a few of the post-traumatic stress symptoms that we saw. Um, the, one of the central ones that we saw was hyperarousal. Uh, it's a state in which the body is on permanent alert as if the danger can return at any moment. Uh, in the interviews, many spoke about the triggers that remind them of the invasion and evoke the fears and cessations of that night. Uh, and with sleep disruption, with hyperarousal come sleep disruptions, um, which all the people we interviewed spoke about. Sleep disruptions interfere with the sufferer's lives. They can impede ability to function. When they're prolonged, these disruptions can take a heavy toll on physical and mental well-being. Uh, and a lot of the respondents spoke about, you know, being awake from 1 a.m. or 2 a.m., which is when the soldiers came in their experience, to only falling back to sleep uh, after the call of the Morazine, which marked when the soldiers leave, or waking up each time uh, a car drove past. And this was very much a, a constant uh, theme that we saw in, in each uh, interview. Another aspect that we saw a lot of uh, is symptoms of anxiety. This often uh, happens in conjunction with post-traumatic uh, stress. Uh, there's the sense that the soldiers could come right back into the bedroom uh, at any given moment. You know, many times uh, uh, it's a traditional society, so uh, soldiers would come into bedrooms where the, the woman isn't necessarily covered, uh, and there's the added element of that. Uh, and anxiety is very much a normal reaction to such events. Um, the anxiety remained long after the event itself. And then you know, a natural aspect is that you would search to reduce anxiety. And these can, uh, this action can reach the level of over-responsivity. Uh, and that means that you take precautions that are unwarranted by the reality and ultimately impede daily functioning and reduce quality of life. And I wanna read one such witness statement. I really don't fall asleep, but stay up and walk around with a flashlight to check around the house in my son's apartment, which is under construction and nearing completion. I've asked for two windows to be blocked with cinder blocks because I think the soldiers can jump in, into the house through them. My husband asked an iron worker to put bars on the doors. The iron worker told him it's a home, not a prison. My husband told him my wife is constantly afraid and wants to turn the house into her own prison to feel safe. I've heard from most women in the village that the soldiers go straight into their bedrooms and that they open their eyes and see a soldier standing over their heads near the bed. It made me go into never ending fear and paranoia. Now, that's the impact that we see on adults. I wanna uh, stop for a moment and say what we saw in terms of the impact on children. Uh, in children, the experience of trauma uh, can result in impaired development, uh, particularly when it comes to younger children because uh, uh, compared to adults, children have greater difficulty understanding and emotionally containing such processes. And then you have the parents who experience distress following the home invasion and also with respect to other aspects of the ongoing occupation. And that may impair their ability to give their children a sense of security that is necessary for the recovery process. Uh, and meanwhile, the, the children feel that the parents are unable to protect them. So in children too, we saw hyperarousal and sleep disruptions. Uh, we also saw anxiety that manifested in increased dependence on parents. Uh, this ranged from you know, teenagers who wanted to sleep in the same bed as their parents. And if the parents refused, they would hide under the covers with the lights on. Uh, children who don't want to leave to go to school because uh, they don't want to uh, leave their parents' side. Children who dropped out of school, and here we really heard about um, impact on the, on the children's ability to participate in school and in social activities. Uh, I wanna speak uh, quickly about F, um, the, the seven-year-old girl who uh, tried to, um, to commit suicide. 
Uh, F continued talking about the fear and the pain of losing her mother for months after the incident. She remained very much dependent on her mother, cried often, uh, became extremely fearful when her mother was away and she refused to sleep by herself. Um, so to summarize, you know, I spoke about various aspects of um, uh, the potentially traumatic event that is forcible home invasion. And what I want you to, to, to take away is that these events have extensive and negative mental health impact. Uh, unfortunately, to recover from such potentially traumatizing events, uh, you need to regain that sense of safety. And here, because of the occasionally the reoccurring nature uh, of these events, whether it's to you, to your neighbors, um, to your village, uh, there isn't that possibility. And that has an impact beyond the individual and the family and a societal impact at large. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. That was uh, very, very interesting and very moving. I have to say, as a mother and a grandmother, the thought of not being able to protect your children or your grandchildren is really quite traumatic, just thinking about it. Um, yes. I can't imagine how how traumatizing it must be to actually be there in that position. Um, I want to bring in next Murad, Murad Jadala. Um, Murad is a Yeshtin field researcher who resides in East Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Murad. Is Murad still on the call? Yes, I think it's connecting his, uh, to the audio just now. Moral? I see he's trying to speak, but I think there's some technical problem. Okay. Um, would you like to, to carry on then, Ziv, and try and cover what Murad was going to, to cover? Would that be possible? And if yeah, he maybe, to read... maybe if, if he will fix it, he can speak after yes. I... Yes, yes. <laughs> maybe I'll try... now. Sorry? Murad, you want to give it another go? Murad? No, we can't so, hear him. Yeah, so I'll try to, to jump to the end and maybe we'll go back. Thank you. Uh, so first of all, thank you for inviting us again and thanks Avner and Dana and hopefully Murad yeah. as well at the end. Ah, now no. I can hear you. Oh, can you speak Murad? I can't hear you. But we can I hear you. No, if you hear me or not. We do. Do you hear me? Okay. So, hi everyone. Uh, good evening. I'm Murad. I'm a legal researcher uh, for HD in the south of West Bank. Uh, what I want to tell you about is one of the cases that I met during my work in this project for HD. We went to a house in a Doha area, which is next to a Dehesha refugee camp. And by, yeah, last year in 2022, uh, and it was in February, 20 of February, the army invaded uh, a house for a young man, young Palestinian man to arrest him. And there is two floors. In the first floor, we have the owner of the building, and upstairs, uh, yani another family from Petir rent the house. And uh, I, I am sure that, and everyone is sure that the Shabak and the army, they know uh, this building, they know where this young man is living, and they insist to enter in the two fl floors. And in the first floor, the owner, his name Mundar Mizher, is around 50, 52 years old. He's a bland, and uh, they broke the, the, the door of the house. They get inside his, his room, and they start to beat him in the bed in front of his 
wife. They didn't stop for like three, four minutes. He can He couldn't. You know, you know, who's beating him? Thieves, soldiers, uh, someone from around. No one could tell him until three, four minutes when his wife was shouting to the soldiers and to ask them to stop beating this blind man who was still sleeping in his bed. And they beat uh, the three of his children in the same time. And they put them in, in the floor and they, um, they told them, if you want to, you know, if you do anything, we can kill you here. And this is not the only hard case that we met in this project. Almost all the cases is very hard. Uh, every time we took um, a uh, testimony, it was very hard to me personally. And as a Palestinians, you know, since 67 until today, Israel arrests almost 800,000 Palestinians, which means among four Palestinians, there is one at least who was in prison. And this is not for the security of Israel. This is not f for any reason, just you know, one of the reasons, you know, the most important reason for this arrest and invasion of the, the houses is to, to terrify the Palestinians and to, to let them know that uh, this occupation is forever and they have no hope to, to resist. In, in Nahalin, also, soldiers came to arrest a man or a young man. Uh, and people from the, from the village start to throw stones at the soldiers from outside the house. And the soldiers inside the house, they use their M16 and they start to tear you know, inside the house. And even the young man who was in, in his bed, they injured him and uh, then they arrested him. So you know, soldiers use weapons inside the houses. And in some cases, it, it, you know, you know, sometimes without a reason. You know, if someone throws stones at the soldiers out the, outside the house, you don't have the legitimacy to use your M16 inside the house. But what we can see, what people think, what people feel, that we are, as a Palestinian, we are a legitimate target for any soldiers at any moment, at any time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Murad. It was very, I'm pleased your uh, internet connection worked in the end. Uh, we appreciate it. Ziv, do you want to just come in before I open up to questions? Thanks. Sure, I just I'll try to do it very quickly because I see there's not a lot of time left and I do want to keep time for questions. So I just want to say that uh, beyond the uh, exposing the, the topic of home invasions and raising awareness to it, we feel it is uh, possible to maybe reduce the numbers of the home invasions that Israel is uh, doing every night. Uh, and besides the report and the, the uh, um, public work that we did uh, uh, around it, Yashdin uh, uh, and uh, Physicians for Human Rights Israel uh, has submitted a petition to the High Court of Justice in Israel on March. Uh, and the petition was uh, basically a, a demand to change the policy of the searches, uh, the invasions that are done in, in order to uh, perform a search in the, in the house. Basically what we asked uh, is that the military commander will change the military legislation uh, in a way that there will be a judicial review uh, on searches and that uh, there will be a judge, maybe a military judge, but we didn't uh, specify but uh, a judge that will approve uh, the invasion in order to commit a search, uh, except of course for uh, urgent and un unusual uh, incidents uh, like it is actually in Israel and in any country almost. Uh, there was an, a hearing on this petition, but it is still pending, so I can't tell you uh, what will happen in the end. In the meantime, at least I think uh, uh, we might get some transparency on the procedures and uh, 
on the commands uh, that uh, uh, the soldiers get while doing surges. And we hope, of course, to achieve more. But I think that there is an important uh, uh, aspect or um, even value uh, to the fact that the army knows that someone is looking uh, and that someone uh, is us, of course, the organizations and uh, maybe the court, but we want also kind of want to, to ask you uh, maybe to do whatever you can. And uh, for example, maybe when you meet Israeli officials, maybe the Ministry of Justice, the uh, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the, the Ministry of Defense, you can ask, uh, first of all, for data on the number of home invasions and the reasons for home invasions uh, and to create the feeling that someone is reviewing in a way what the army is uh, performing in the West Bank. Another thing you can do is actually uh, to try to ask them why not to change the policy. Uh, at least. Can I, the, just, can I just interrupt those? Oh, is there oh, any oh, timeline on when you think that will be coming before the courts? That petition you've made. It. it there was uh, already first hearing. Uh, it was semi-successful, uh, and we do know that the judges felt that at least there needs to be some transparency on what are the procedures and commands. And uh, the state then uh, released some variation of the procedure. It's not very clear if it's really the procedure or just a paraphrase on the procedure. Yeah. Uh, and we replied to that and we, we tried to uh, insist on the fact that they need to change the legislation, the mili military legislation and to have ju judicial review and yeah. that we will not be satisfied with just transparency, but we'll yeah. see.